Well, let's pray. Lord, we do <clears throat> thank you for your graciousness to us and in the fact that we do not um, mourn as others mourn, Lord. We have the, the hope of heaven before us, and uh, we thank you for <clears throat> Doug's life and his um, uh, generosity and just all the characteristics of his life that drew so many people to faith in, uh, in you through, uh, through him and through his family. And pray for Elizabeth and Noah that um, you would bring comfort to them, not just certainly today, but uh, in the days ahead and, and uh, in the coming years, especially for, uh, for Noah. And Lord, as we think about heaven, as we are in our study here and, and um, the midpoint of the tribulation, we're going to get a little a little glimpse of heaven and the, and the worship that's there. And we're thankful that, uh, that we have um, heaven to live for and, and not this world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John, <clears throat> last week we saw was commanded, commanded, prophesy again. Remember, we talked about that word was, uh, I did a little word search and it was only used one other time in the New Testament in that particular tense where it was a command, and it was a command by the Sanhedrin, or the head of the Sanhedrin to Jesus, telling him to prophesy. And uh, that's what the angel says to John at, at the end. You're going to have to continue on. We're at the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, John is going to have to now prophesy at, at part of what's going on in the tribulation and, and the horrific judgments that are still ahead. Uh, the fact that... Uh, there will be a holocaust against the Jews in the second half of the tribulation, unlike anything anyone has ever seen. And, and John pretty much has to be commanded to, uh, to continue on. Um, we're going to look at that a, a little bit. Here we're going to be introduced to uh, two witnesses that have been apparently prophesying uh, during the first half of the tribulation uh, in Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and uh, that... Uh, ministry is going to come to the end uh, here at the midpoint. That's one of the other things that happen. And then because of talking about Jerusalem, there's going to be the several statements about the uh, rebuilding of, of the temple. So let's take a look at um, the first couple of verses. That say that I was <coughs> given a, a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the courts, which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it's been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months or the, uh, the last half of the tribulation. So uh, John's given instruction to measure the temple and um, uh, the temple, the altar and, and the people. And uh, I've got a couple of uh, slides for you. I won't turn around, but just uh, the first one just shows, uh, um, again, the Dome of the Rock in the, in the Temple the temple Mount area, just so you can, I don't know if you can get much of a scale from it, but it's, it's like, I, don't, I think it's like 20, 25 acres. It's very large. So when we talk about the, the uh, uh, Jewish people, Israel, rebuilding the Jewish temple, which is what this text indicates, and we're going to look at several other verses. Uh, of course, it's, uh, the difficulty comes in the fact that the Temple Mount area is controlled by the, um, uh, by the, the basically the Islam right to, today, and by the Palestinians. And uh, so, <clears throat> but there, it will get rebuilt in the future. There's plenty of room there to, to rebuild it. Uh, like I say, there's almost 20, 20 acres up there. You want to go to the next slide? Now that's a, a, a picture of Herod's temple made out of Jerusalem stone, scale model. It's in Jerusalem at one of the hotels there. It's the whole city. It's really quite a, quite a thing to, uh, uh, to see. But that large building that's in the middle, <clears throat> the real tall one, that's what's spoken of in our text when it says measure the temple. It's not talking about measure everything in the entire temple grounds as we think about Solomon's temple. It's only talking about that one building, that tall portion, which is where the priest went to offer sacrifice and to go into the Holy of Holies. So, so that's, that's what is, is going to get rebuilt in the future up on that Temple Mount. Now, like I say, we'll go through some scriptures. We make reference to this all, all the time, but we'll give you three or four scriptures to kind of show that 
uh, as we kind of the, the pieces of the puzzle to put them together, as we've talked about in prophecy, to get a clear picture of what's going on. Now, <laughs> this idea of the Jews rebuilding the temple is something that is discussed all the time in, in Israel today. There's the temple, uh, there's Temple Mount movements. There's uh, a group that has already recreated uh, everything they need to go inside the uh, the temple. There's a place in Jerusalem where you can go visit at least and see a portion of the things that, that they have uh, recreated, the implements that the priests will need and uh, and so forth. Um, the, um, it was President Clinton that actually put on the table as far as part of the peace process what's known as the Clintonian plan, the idea that among Everybody's got to give and take here if the Palestinians are going to get a state and live side by side with Israel. And one of the things that he suggested they do is allow the Jews to rebuild a temple on the Temple Mount. And uh, that is still on the table and that is still discussed uh, to this uh, very day. So it's uh, one of the things we talk about in studying prophecy is that we're, we're watching it you know, daily. I just got a little email update from the Middle East this morning, and um, Secretary of State Clinton uh, is, uh, is in Israel today, and uh, <clears throat> she has the Islamic world up in arms right now because, uh, because of her comments that were made at a press conference uh, hours ago where she talked about the fact that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, is on track uh, saying that they should be able to still continue to build within, within Jerusalem. Our text, we just read that Jerusalem's going to get trampled on by the Gentiles for 42 months. There's a lot of people that like to see that happen. In other words, non-Jewish people take over the whole city. There's a whole movement. It's been going for quite a long time to try to make Jerusalem an, quote, international city. Since it's the, the city of not only, only Jews, but uh, Islam and, and Christianity. And you've got... <clears throat> <laughs> you got Baha'i and all kind of other groups that uh, that uh, somehow claim some allegiance to, to Jerusalem as, as well. But uh, that's a big movement discussed all the time in, in the UN. Lots of pressure on on uh, Israel and the Netanyahu government to not continue to build in East Jerusalem, which has been <clears throat> primarily um, a um, kind of the uh, Islamic side of uh, of the city, the Palestinian side of the city and was off limits to Jews until they took it over in, in the 67 uh, Six-Day War. Uh, so the things that we're talking about here are the things that are being discussed not on prophecy websites, but on our daily news, <laughs> on CNN and, and some of the other, other stations. So John's given instructions to measure the temple, but the word temple is the holy place where only the priests would go. The altar could be the brazen altar, or it could be the altar of incense. Uh, we don't really know which. But again, the, uh, this will get done in the future. And I want to take you through a couple of three or four scriptures just to <clears throat> kind of piece this whole thing together. Uh, the idea is introduced by the prophet Daniel. Remember, Daniel really gives us the full timeline down to the exact days for the tribulation period. We say that between, <clears throat> between Daniel and between John, they kind of give us the border pieces to the puzzle. You know, you want to put those together first so you can start kind of making your way in. And Daniel says in 927 <clears throat> that then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end <clears throat> to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing, wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Does that sound King James or what? <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> you probably get a better feel for it in the NIV. But um, basically Daniel is saying, I'm taking Sudafed like crazy to get my ears to open up. And um, funny thing, it really dries your throat out as well. <coughs> so hang on. I'm okay if you're okay. But I'll, I'll be a little gravelly here today. But the bottom line is that this temple is going to get rebuilt. Daniel says that it would in the future. And the Antichrist at a point in time during the tribulation, we know it's in the middle of the tribulation, on a wing of the temple will set up an image that would cause what Jesus says in quoting Daniel, the abomination that causes desolation. Now these are the words of, of Jesus in Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, 
Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So this ruler, the Antichrist, is going to, again, we've got to have a temple for him to stand on the wings of the temple, right? Uh, Daniel 12, 11 uh, adds to this. He says, and from the time <clears throat> that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So daily sacrifices. So we've got to have a temple. If he's going to stand on the wings of the temple, we've got to have a temple if there's daily sacrifices going on that he's going to stop. And then Paul kind of <coughs> helps paint the picture in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. He who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, it's talking about the Antichrist again, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination that causes desolation. When the Antichrist sets himself up in a wing of the temple, sets an image of himself up in, 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 the, uh, in the temple itself, God's holy temple, and then tells everybody that he now, he is God come in the flesh, and he is the, be, uh, the one to be worshipped. So again, this will take place in the middle of the tribulation. That's our timeline right now in, in, uh, in Revelation. And of course, what will change then, he's been the friend of Israel up until that time, He's the one that allows them to rebuild the temple. And from that point on, as Jesus said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, the Antichrist in the temple demanding to be worshipped, if you're Jewish, you'd better flee and flee to the mountains or flee to the wilderness because at that point there'll be, there'll be tremendous persecution against the Jews. David Hawking says this about the question of terms, why measure the temple? He said the Gentiles will once again take control of Jerusalem and its holy sites. Because of the reference to the temple worshipers, the measurement indicates God's protection of his people during such a Gentile takeover. Measuring means I've got control, I've got sovereignty, measure the worshipers. And um, so uh, there's an indication that God will, those that are in the city will, will protect them so they can get out of the city uh, at this time. The second thing about this is John has given instructions to leave the outer court to the Gentiles because, again, as I said, they're going to take over uh, Jerusalem uh, at that time. The times of the Gentiles is what we live in now, and they will continue until Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, and we'll see that in Revelation 19. Now, again, if you're not familiar with the situation there, um, it was in 1967, actually the Six-Day War was June 5th uh, to June 10th, when Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria all attacked Israel simultaneously. Um, there's some wonderful stories about how God sovereignly protected Israel, allowed them to defend themselves, uh, tremendously outnumbered. <clears throat> Two of the stories are in a great little book called The Mossad, <clears throat> and a man named Eli Cohen, who was... Uh, who was a spy and went into Damascus and uh, worked his way in over a period of time to become uh, friends with the leaders, the top leaders of the government. He was exposed to all the intelligence, everything that was going on. When the war broke out and they were going to attack, Israel knew exactly all the positions to hit, uh, where the Assyrians would attack from. They knew uh, every detail. Eli Cohen, by the way, towards the end, as he shortwaved his uh, messages uh, out of the country, uh, was, uh, was captured and was uh, hung publicly. And uh, a tremendous hero in the, in the nation of Israel uh, today. But uh, uh, there were those kinds of things going on pre-1967. But also then you have men that are uh, in the government today like Ariel Sharon and, and others that uh, uh, were part of that war and will speak of God's supernatural intervention as they were attacked. Now, so they, they were able to defend themselves. They took over the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, East Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years, and the Golan Heights. And that's what people are fighting about and screaming about in, uh, as far as the Palestinians and, uh, and Israel today. The, um, by the way, the Palestinian state is Jordan. <laughs> it's, this is this is just all, all an attack against uh, against uh, Israel, but the point is, 
is Israel had the Temple Mount <coughs> for a couple of days. They had the whole city, and they kept control of the whole city. But they determined, again, they were, you know, secular, you know, civic leaders, not religious leaders. And they determined that if they would turn the Temple Mount area back over to uh, the Islamic officials, they could stay off an additional attack and, and offer that as a, an appeasement to, uh, to prevent further war. So fortunately or unfortunately, in God's sovereign plan, that's, that's what they did. So when you go to Israel today, I mean, uh, you can go wherever you like in, in the city, but uh, as you, if you go to the Temple Mount and up above, uh, it's all controlled by Islamic security guards uh, up there, which makes, <laughs> makes for a very interesting juxtaposition of, of you have all the, the Jews worshiping down below on the Western Wall, and, and you've got the Muslims uh, up, up above, and it's always a place of, of high tension. And that's why uh, people know that this is going to happen. And as far as people that study the Bible and, and prophecy in particular, this temple is going to get rebuilt, but it's like, but... But how? <laughs> how is this going to get resolved? The Antichrist will resolve it. That's the big issue. That's really at the beginning of the tribulation. He makes a way for that temple, this temple, to get rebuilt. And, uh, but in the middle of the tribulation, it, it all turns against uh, Israel. So there'll be a, a temple in, in the future. Uh, secondly, there'll be two prophets with a, with a unique ministry. Verse 3 says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God, the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devour, devours their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So very uh, interesting characters uh, here. And we find out that at this point in the mid-tribulation that they've actually been prophesying and been active in Israel for this, uh, this entire time and that they've been protected by uh, God uh, supernaturally. And, uh, and so they have uh, quite, a, quite a ministry. Now, we, we talked about the 144,000 Jews that come to faith in Jesus or Yeshua and uh, they are sealed by God, and they're going around the world preaching the gospel, and there's a worldwide revival. We talked about ways in which they may have heard the gospel and, and gotten saved. And remember, uh, the, the, the one view is that they would hear J. Vernon McGee on the radio, and that's how they got saved. That was view number one. Uh, view number two, we talked about that when we came across them, was uh, it could be because of all the Messianic congregations that are in Israel today, and all of the, all the immigrants by the tens of thousands that have poured in from Russia uh, and from Africa that are Jewish believers that have messianic expectations, they're looking for a Messiah who is going to be the fulfillment of Scripture. It could be that uh, many of them get saved at this time. And it could be, view number three would be from the preaching of these two prophets, which uh, have supernatural power and uh, are there preaching for 1,260 days uh, and very much in the manner and the like of uh, Old Testament prophets. Uh, notice that they're wearing sackcloth. Again, it's a garment worn by uh, those in the Old Testament indicating that their message would have been a message of repentance. In other words, when, uh, when the people of Israel were in sin, then the prophets would put on their sackcloth, a symbol of their repentance and praying for and exhorting the people to turn from their sin. So uh, it's not a, a real mystery in terms of what their message was and what they were prophesying uh, or preaching. And certainly we see that uh, in the likes of John the Baptist and the ministry that he had. Secondly, the thing about these guys, the two prophets had a unique identity uh, verse 4, they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of earth. This, again, is a reference to Zechariah 4. Uh, Zechariah is uh, also someone who is uh, preaching a message of repentance. The Jews are coming out of the Babylonian captivity. That's the context. Uh, and he is there exhorting them to rebuild the temple. Hey, that's what we're talking about here. And, uh, and so John is, is, sees this image and captures it and puts it in the text that we might understand more about the identity of, of these guys. Now, in Zechariah's 
uh, prophecy. Uh, he's got the, uh, the two menorah, the golden menorah, and he's got a vision of olive trees, two olive trees that feed them. Again, the, the oil supplying the light, all being a picture of the oil being the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's Zacharias that says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit, saith the Lord. That's how we're going to accomplish anything. In their case, building the temple. And when they got it done, it was just shouts of, interesting, grace, grace, grace. It was the grace of God that allowed them to come out of the captivity as God promised they would to rebuild the temple and now to lay the cornerstone uh, and see it done. He's making reference, the two olive trees in that case were, uh, were actually Joshua and Zerubbabel, one a civic leader and one a religious leader, who were calling and inspiring uh, the children of Israel to go back and re rebuild the temple. So now that, that picture comes then and is applied to these guys uh, here in Jerusalem. They are the two lampstands as well as the two uh, olive trees. And, uh, and so it may be that, uh, again, uh, they're, they're calling the people to repentance, but uh, they may be calling them to more than that in terms of uh, what maybe what's going on at the temple at that time. Maybe they have a hand in, in, uh, in what's going on in, in leading the 144,000 to faith in Christ as well. But uh, their identity is, is likened to Zechariah 4, but their names are, are not given. That's our third thing. The two prophets remain anonymous. When I was uh, going to school, I, uh, I took pretty much every class I could from uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Arnold's a Jewish scholar, wonderful, brilliant guy. And, um, and so in his book, The Footsteps of, of, uh, of the Messiah, uh, he reveals the identity of who the two prophets are. And I want to quote him. They are two Jewish guys. That's who they are. So I, I knew that you would want to know that always comes up, who are the two witnesses in Revelation 11? They're two Jewish guys, uh, and they're there for 1,260 days. Uh, most people, if they want to speculate, and we love to speculate, uh, believe that they're Moses and Elijah. Let me give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, because uh, Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. They both had miraculous powers. They both appeared together with uh, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, it was the prophet Elijah that appeared on the scene, uh, excuse me, that will appear on the scene again before the Messiah returns. So that announcement in the bullet then saying that Elijah's here, that's not the Elijah that we're talking about here. I thought I should clarify that. It could be just coincidental, but uh, 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 although it could be so that maybe he is the one and Jesus is coming back very soon. But based on Malachi 4.5, uh, there uh, the prophet says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth uh, with a curse. Because that would be an issue, wouldn't it? If you were Jewish and you heard that preaching and you put your faith in Jesus as the Messiah, would that, would that cause a problem with you and your father? Yes, it would. Would it cause a problem between a father and a son? Yes, it would. But Elijah, the prophet, the Old Testament prophet, is going to come back according to Malachi, and he will, he will bring those hearts together in terms of uh, Jewish families uh, with the understanding that Jesus is, uh, is the Messiah. Uh, that, that is going to happen. Now, when John the Baptist was born, uh, and uh, we read about that in Luke chapter 1, uh, it talks about the fact that, uh, that John the Baptist would come according to the angel in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And then Jesus makes reference to that in 11, 11 14. Jesus there says, uh, if you are willing to receive it, he, referring to John the Baptist, is Elijah who is to come. So again, everybody knew that Elijah would have to come before the Messiah came. Jesus, the Messiah, comes his forerunner, he says, is John the Baptist, but he comes as Elijah if you can receive it. They didn't receive it, and they rejected Jesus as, uh, as the Messiah uh, nationally. Certainly individually, thousands and tens of thousands of them uh, received him, but as a nation, they rejected him. And so now the nation of Israel continues to wait, and the world waits for this Elijah to come because he is the forerunner, as John the Baptist was, to, to Jesus Christ. 
Now, every year at Passover, during the Passover Seder, even like the ones that we have here, there's a point in time where at the head table, we always have an empty chair. And we try not to overbook so that we've got to put somebody in Elijah's chair that's uh, not kosher. But we try to have an empty chair for Elijah, uh, as they do in Passover services uh, all around the world. And there's a point in time in the service, you remember, we send one of the kids out in the hallway here to yell for Elijah to see if he's there. Because every year we're remembering the Passover and we're asking, is Elijah here? Is he coming? Because when he comes, the Messiah will come and he will establish his kingdom. Now, for you and I, we know that Jesus, the Messiah, has already come, and he will come again to establish his kingdom. But Jewish people around the world, every year at Passover, are wondering, is this the year? Is Elijah here? We've got a chair for him. There's even a special cup on the table uh, for, uh, for Elijah. Uh, and so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good reasons why um, many uh, good scholars, commentators, believe that these two, even though we know for sure they are two Jewish guys. Uh, you can uh, bet on that, but they, they may very well be Moses and Elijah. Now, David Hawkins has commented on his times with us and just in conversation, uh, he has the opportunity to speak to Jewish groups all, all around the country and sometimes around the world because they want to know what the Bible, what the New Testament says about prophecy and about the book of Revelation and about the coming of the Messiah and what's his view. And uh, He's had private meetings with uh, uh, the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Menachem Begin, and, and others. And they'll say, David, tell us what the Bible says. What do you think? Uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, they, they, they want to know. And he'll, he'll, he'll kind of tell them what we're, what we're going through here in our study in a more condensed version. And then he'll mention the two prophets and that he thinks that one will be Moses and one will be Elijah. And he's had more than one rabbi say to him that, David... If Elijah comes back here and he tells me that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, I'll believe. And I think that's probably what will happen. Because uh, I think a lot of hearts, that's what Elijah will do. He'll turn hearts together uh, that would, uh, and families together, Jewish families that separate over the issue of whether Jesus is the Messiah uh, or not. All of this is going on and, and, and it culminates uh, in this uh, midpoint of the tribulation. Now, the third thing, the two prophets will have, as I mentioned, supernatural protection and powers, and uh, God gives them pretty awesome powers if they have any, uh, have any enemies, uh, anyone that tries to destroy them because of their preaching about the kingdom of God and repentance and so forth, that fire comes out of their mouth and destroys them. I'm just kind of betting that's going to get picked up on the news somewhere. It's just, just a wild thought. What do you think? Uh, I think that might make the headlines for a while. I don't know if the Antichrist will shut it down real quick. He'll be controlling everything. But, uh, but we know that these two guys get seen worldwide uh, at a point in time. But they have a supernatural power, and God protects them. They have the ability to shut up heaven, prevent rain coming, which Elijah had that power. Uh, and then they also have the power to turn water into blood, which is what Moses did uh, in, in Egypt. The third thing about this point in the tribulation, there'll be a turning point in the expectations of the Jewish people. We've alluded to that already. That's in verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So God protects them for the 1,260 days. God allows that protection or lifts that protection so the Antichrist he is the one that comes out of the bottomless pit. There's 36 references in Revelation to the beast, and it is a little confusing at times. But uh, over in chapter 17, it says, uh, uh, the beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Uh, we'll look at some more of these as we go through them, but the bottom line is that uh, there, there is, and we'll be introduced to them soon, a false prophet as well as the Antichrist, uh, and then uh, and a false religious system, and then Satan himself, kind of an unholy trinity. Uh, but um, most identify this person coming out of the bottomless pit 
as being the, the Antichrist, of course, empowered and energized by Satan himself. <clears throat> now, I gave you that philosophical argument about um, who could climb out of a bottomless pit, and uh, Fred reminded me that someone will be able to. So the Antichrist is the exception. Otherwise, you can't get out of a bottomless pit. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. The, uh, but uh, anyway, he is the one that comes out. He is the one, again, as God allows, uh, to kill the two witnesses there in Jerusalem. It's also quite a sad commentary when it says that Jerusalem spiritually is like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not a compliment. So the spiritual deterioration in the city is, uh, is, is tragic at this point, according to uh, that passage of Scripture. Uh, secondly, the turning point will include having their bodies lay in the streets uh, of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And, um, and again, it makes it obvious the city is where our Lord was crucified. And, uh, and so publicly, the, the two witnesses, uh, the publicity they receive is incredible. And of course, um, we could not have imagined how this would be possible until, until satellites came along. But we watch events, news events from around the world on a regular basis, and we don't think uh, anything of it. And, uh, and so uh, evidently their death will be such a, a big thing that it will be covered worldwide through all, all the news agencies, uh, and people will see it from around the world. And the third thing is part of that turning point includes a celebration over their death. Simply stated, these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, interesting, you know, they, they weren't just toasting guys left and right because they had this ability. It's if anyone attacked them to prevent their message from getting out, then, uh, then they were killed. But uh, so the message of repentance, the message of God's coming kingdom, the message of Jesus being the Messiah who will rule and reign here on planet Earth causes <laughs> torment. I think it already does. I think it already does in some places. It's, it's just very interesting. There, there, there are some, some circles of, uh, uh, of uh, our culture where uh, to say those things that I just said infuriates, uh, infuriates people. I don't know if you noticed or paid attention, but uh, amongst everything else that's going on within the legislative system in, in Washington, D.C., is that President Obama this week uh, signed the, uh, the, the, the hate crime legislation something they've been talking about for a number of years, and the way they got it passed was by attaching it to the defense spending bill. Therefore, they were daring Republicans to not vote for it so they could use it in a campaign against them that they voted against a 3 or 4% raise for, for our military and for the budget that they need to fight the war in Afghanistan and fight terrorism around the world. So that's, that's the legislation, and they attached a hate crime bill to it. What does that mean in terms of the hate crime bill? Well, it ties in here a little bit. It's the idea that if I preach a message from the Word of God and I say something that God says about, for example, the homosexual community and that that's a sin, to me that's good news because Jesus died for sin. People can be forgiven of sin uh, and restored and so forth. So I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as a good thing. But somebody could listen to that, and if somebody heard some remarks that I made, uh, about uh, homosexuality in a negative light and so forth, and if later... They became incensed over something else they saw or whatever, and they beat somebody up, and they turned to be, out to be a homosexual. This is where the trial lawyers loved this part, and they were pushing for it. Then not only can that guy sue and go to court, the guy that beat him up, but he can come back and get me as well because I helped incite him to do the crime. That's the hate crimes legislation that we just signed into law. Uh, very interesting times that, uh, that we're living in. Now, they've, they have a more severe... Um, uh, law like that already in Australia and, uh, and uh, in Great Britain as well. And it's kind of played out in, in those kind of terms. In, the, in Canada right now, uh, they have a, a hate crimes bill where pastors have been arrested and then fined for just saying things, again, uh, in terms of depicting what goes on in the Bible in God's position uh, in regards to homosexuality, who are people that he loved and he died for, and we, we want to see them all go to heaven and, uh, and be forgiven of their sins and enjoy the life that we have and, and, and so forth. To me, there's nothing hateful about that. 
but uh, those are the days that we are living in. E evidently, this is going to get escalated to such a point in the mid-tribulation that when these guys are telling people about God's coming kingdom and the need to repent from your sins, it's tormenting people so that <clears throat> when they're killed by the Antichrist, they have like a satanic Christmas around the world, and they're, uh, they're all thrilled about it uh, in exchanging gifts. It will be a, a, a very... A very interesting world uh, at that time. Let's go on in our text. The fourth thing is there'll be a powerful witness of God's power at the midpoint of the tribulation, and that's in verses 11 to 14. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of the life from God entered them, the two witnesses, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of, of heaven. Very interesting turn of events. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Oh, hang on here. So the first thing we notice is that the power, uh, uh, powerful witness will be seen in, in a resurrection and a rapture, because that's, that's what happens uh, God breathes life into them once again. This is in the midst of all the celebrations <laughs> that is going on over their death. Uh, people are just a, a little bit freaked out uh, about that. There's a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. Uh, the same kind of uh, a voice and the same phrasing for John when John's first called to heaven to get this whole revelation. And, uh, and so we have here another rapture in the Bible, and there's several raptures uh, in the Bible. And what we talk about most certainly is, is the rapture of the church, but we have Elijah being raptured up, and, and we have several others. Now, the difference is the church will be raptured in the twinkling of an eye, uh, which is a, a, a measurement of time that cannot be measured, uh, is the idea. Whereas these guys ascend to heaven in a cloud very much like Jesus did when, when, he, uh, when he was raptured, when he ascended to heaven uh, after his uh, death and his resurrection. Uh, and then, again, it's a loud voice uh, that is uh, possibly God himself uh, or possibly the archangel we've already identified that is uh, calling him up to heaven or them up to heaven. Uh, secondly, the uh, powerful witness will be seen in, not only in, in their, their resurrection and rapture, but also in a great earthquake. Uh, the results, of course, is uh, 7,000 die there in Jerusalem. Uh, there are those that then remain are fearful and give glory to God. And there's two opinions on this. Either they're just like really freaked out that this has happened and they're fearful of God, but that doesn't mean that they've turned to God and, and asked to be forgiven of their sins and so forth. The demons are pretty much afraid of God as well, but I don't think any of them are saved. Uh, but, but they are afraid and they give glory to God. Because of that second phrase, there are some that think that at at the ascension of these two guys in Jerusalem and, and uh, everybody seen and heard their message, there's, there's something of a viability now or validity that what they were saying was true and people actually get saved uh, at, uh, at this moment. Uh, and then the scene changes here in verse 15 and 19. There will be rejoicing in heaven at the mo announcement of the triumph of God's kingdom. And it's another one of these heavenly scenes around the throne of God uh, a couple of things here, very interesting. Verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dread that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunders, thunderings, and earthquake and great hail." So uh, a couple of things that are important to note here is that the triumph will be heard as the seventh angel gets ready to sound his trumpet. Uh, and that will, that will begin, chronologically anyway, the second half of the tribulation. And that trumpet will continue to sound 
for, for three and a half years, and we'll initiate, we'll get to it in a few weeks, what are the final judgments, uh, the bold judgments. Uh, and God basically is announcing at this point that he is taking over. I mean, you think about the history of the world, and now we're at the point where we're down to the last three and a half years. Heaven's a little bit excited about it. And um, I'm sure they're, they're totally baffled over, over us <laughs> and over mankind and some of our, uh, the things we do and don't do and our attitudes and, uh, and, and so forth. And I think they'll probably be very excited to see God's kingdom finally come uh, to, to this earth. So that's being announced. Also, the triumph is heard when the 24 elders initiate uh, worship. And again, the 24 elder, elders are representative of the, of the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, so they are up there, and as we've seen in the past, as they fall down and begin to worship, it just initiates, and all heaven begins to, uh, to worship, worship God. <clears throat> David Hawking, in his book, uh, Coming World Leader, uh, kind of summarizes uh, what's going on in, in four statements. One, he says, God's power is being proclaimed. Uh, we see that uh, in what it says, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. His power is being proclaimed. <clears throat> God's plan is being accomplished. There's a reference to judging the dead uh, and the accountability, therefore, that we have before God. So one day, unbelievers of this world will all stand before God and be judged. Now, keep in mind that they're not being judged whether they're guilty or not. When you go before a, a judge today, if you've been accused of, uh, uh, of committing a crime, you're assumed uh, innocent until proven guilty most of the time. And, uh, and if you are, then you go before the judge, and you hear the evidence, and then he then either says you're guilty or you're innocent. And then you would come back before that judge at a, uh, a second hearing, and he would determine uh, the penalty that had to be paid because of the crime committed. When, it talks, when the Bible talks about those in this world who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior being judged, it's talking about the latter. The Bible says that Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world from its sins. Why? Because everybody in the world is already condemned. <clears throat> sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. That's, thus, sin came to all men because all men die, Paul says in Romans 5.12. <clears throat> sin is in the world, we're born into it, and we're all deserving of judgment. We're not judged if we know Jesus Christ uh, because his blood has paid the penalty for our sins. But everybody else in this world still stands condemned, and when they stand before God, accountable before God for their life one time in the future, it will not be to determine whether they are guilty or not. They are guilty. We're all guilty. It will only determine their sentence, which is to be cast into uh, Gehenna, or the uh, eternal lake of, uh, of fire. So this is being proclaimed uh, at this time as well. In other words, nobody gets away with anything. Uh, it's all going to be, uh, to be dealt with. Thirdly, God's promise is being fulfilled. The reward of God, notice there's talking about the reward. Uh, believers are rewarded by God. And, uh, and certainly they should be, and we should be giving him thanks uh, for that. We will stand before God's uh, judgment seat as well, but it will be the, the Bema seat of Christ. The Bema seat is the seat that was at the Olympics, where if you won your event and so forth, and we love watching the Olympics today, it seems to capture everybody's attention, whether you're, <laughs> whether you're a sports fan or not, there's just something different about the, uh, about the Olympics. And, uh, uh, and you know, when they stand uh, at the end, they stand on that podium, and they raise those flags, and they play that anthem, and, and they get a medal. And of course, in the Olympic days, they got the hakule around their, around their head, and they were standing on the Bema seat. They were getting a reward. So believers will face a judgment as well, not the white throne judgment uh, to determine a sentence, but the Bema seat of Christ where rewards will be, will be given out. And Jesus, uh, again, spoke a lot about that in the parables. The fourth thing is God's punishment is being declared. The, as we said before, the wicked do not escape his, uh, his, his judgment. Uh, the last thing about the triumph, it will be seen when the temple in heaven is opened. And uh, hey, the Ark of the Covenant, we've been wondering where that thing was. We thought it was lost. No. Uh, there's two things going on here. Keep in mind that everything that Moses built was to the exact description 
uh, that God gave him because it was a pattern of what was in heaven. So he built an Ark of the Covenant because there was one in heaven. So the, the, you know, um, the Ark didn't get taken up <laughs> in the clouds. Uh, this, is, this is the real one that's, uh, that's there. Everything in the tabernacle, later transferred to the temple, is a picture of, of heaven. That's why when we study the book of Revelation, we talked about one of the things that we have to do is go back to the future. We have to really understand the tabernacle and everything that's there, why it was there, its purpose for being there, because often it is alluded to uh, directly or indirectly in things that we see when we see these heavenly scenes uh, in heaven. And here we see the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant remind us, a visual reminder of God's sovereignty and, and God's faithfulness. And again, keep in mind that uh, the Ark contained three things. Remember, it contained the uh, the golden pot with some of the manna left uh, that they put in there to remind the people that, hey, God is the provider. He took care of us uh, during the wilderness wandering and so forth. Uh, you may doubt that. You may grumble about that. And they did. And so there had to be a reminder to them about God's faithfulness. I'm glad we're all over that. But uh, for those in the Old Testament, they had to have that. And remember, they had Aaron's rod that had budded because in their rebellion saying, who made you the boss, to Aaron and to Moses? Moses says, well, bring your tribal rods. We're going to put them down on the ground, and we'll let God you know, determine and decide you know, who should be the leader of the nation of Israel. And, uh, and that's, that's when God said to Aaron, this bud's for you. I'm not sure if he said that. I heard it somewhere, though. But uh, remember the rod buds uh, with the, uh, the olive blossoms and, and so forth. Aaron's rod is in there. What's that a reminder of? Rebellion. The people are rebellious against God. Even, these are the same people that he delivered them out of slavery. He did it miraculously. They crossed the Dead Sea, provided the manna, provided the, uh, the, the, the water out of the rock and so forth. And again, keep in mind that, that that deliverance to them in the Old Testament is the type of our deliverance from our sin and the bondage that we are under. All these things that we're looking at in the ark certainly have an application to us. We have our tendency still to be not trust in God's provision and be rebellious against him and against his word. And of course, the other thing that was in the ark was the Ten Commandments, the two, the two tablets, which was the law, which is what condemns us. Paul says it's our schoolmaster to drive us to Christ. Thou shalt not, I think I did that once. Thou shalt, oh, I think I did that a couple times. Thou sh you know, it's, it's what shows us that we need a savior. So it was important. The two cherubim, the angels that were above it on what's called the mercy seat, again, looked down on that mercy seat. What made it a mercy seat is that the high priest, once a year on the day of Yom Kippur, would take the blood of the, of the goat that was shed for the sins of the nation, and he would sprinkle them on that, that mercy seat so that when the angels looked down, they didn't see the rebellion. They didn't see the mistrust, and they didn't see the law that condemned, but they saw blood. It was called an atonement, and it covered, it was the mercy seat. And there's one in heaven, and we're going to see it, and it's going to remind us of those things. It will be a, an absolute, like I think most things in heaven will be, an absolute visual reminder of God's sovereignty, but also God's faithfulness and God's grace. So chapter 11 is a, is a critical turning point as we move again, transitioning from the first half of the tribulation into the second half, and to do it, the angel has to command John prophesy, I command you. And we talked about what a powerful angel that he was. So because uh, horrific things are, are going to happen during this time, and in particular to the Jewish people, because it's in this midpoint, the temple that's being discussed daily in, uh, in Israel and around the world, when we talk about Mideast peace conferences, this is one of the issues that is discussed that's on the table and it's been there since President Clinton brought it, brought it up. And it's going to get rebuilt in the future. And, uh, and this man, this coming world leader, will be a friend of Israel in the beginning. But at the midpoint, he will turn against them and do what Jesus says. He will cause the abomination that causes desolation where he claims himself to be God, demands to be worshipped. And everything will change. Everything will change for the Jewish people in particular at, at that time. We will see